ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وازواجه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and we bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and he is alone having no partners and we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger we ask Allah to exalt his men- we ask Allah to exalt his mention grant him peace and send his blessings and salutations upon him and upon his companions and wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I am quite positive that the vast majority of you are familiar with the famous hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. That hadith is considered one of the most fundamental narrations in Islam. The amount of lessons in it are beyond human explanation. And the amount of time the scholars spent studying it and the amount of work they produced based on this hadith is something that is mind baffling. It is truly one of the evidences of the prophethood and the authenticity of the prophet, prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in this hadith, as you may all know, and I'm just going to summarize it or paraphrase it because you, you know it already. We know that Umar was sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam among other companions as well. When a man appeared who had extremely white clothes, didn't look like he had any signs of travel upon him. And he sat across from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's placed his hands on his knees or thighs and then he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam some questions and he asked him about Islam and then he asked him about Iman and then lastly he asked him about Ihsan afterwards he inquired about the signs of the last day until the end of the narration the part that is relevant to us tonight is Ihsan. A lot of us are familiar with the word. In fact, that word has many derivatives and it appears in the Quran and the Sunnah hundreds if not thousands of times. And in each reference and in each context, the, the meaning or the definition may vary. So we want to tackle the concept of Ihsan not just from a linguistic point of view, or legislative point of view, but also from a practical point of view. What does it mean? What does it really mean? And what definition is most adequate and accurate to the term Ihsan? First of all, let's look at it linguistically. The root word is Hasun or Hasan. وَضِدُّهُ الْإِسَاءَ And that is the state of being well or good and in some context, context excellence and the opposite of that is isa'a harm wrong and evil doing that is a linguistic aspect or perspective on it but what we care for or what we care about the most always is the legislative definition and you could find hundreds of those but how do we look into them when we already have a definition provided by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself? That's why the scholars say no matter how much time you spend in trying to explain Ihsan or the legislative as in the religious definition of the word Ihsan, you will not find a more precise and concise definition than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The one he gave. 
When he said, when Jibreel asked him, أخبرني عن الإحسان قال أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك It is to worship Allah as if you can see him but if you can't see him then know that he sees you know that you see, and that the term know is, is understood it's subliminal it's not it's not explicitly mentioned verily he sees you and when the scholars look into this definition or this breakdown from the prophet وسلم, they also categorize it into two levels the first is higher than the second. And one must go through the second in order to attain the first. Because in everything you have to go step by step, gradually. The highest of them is أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه To worship Allah as if or as though you can see Him. And that does not mean in the physical sense. Because we all know that Allah Azza wa Jal cannot be seen in this dunya. No prophet has seen Allah. And when Prophet Musa asked to see Allah, he was not granted this permission. Even though he is Kalimullah, the one whom Allah spoke to. But when he said, Qala Rabbi Arini Anzur ilayk. He said, my Lord, allow me to gaze, to look at you. Allah replied, as in the Quran, you will not see me. However, look at the mountain. If the mountain is able to remain in its place, then you will be able to see me. When Allah revealed some of his greatness to the mountain, the mountain fell in ruin. وَخَرَّ مُوسَى صَعِقًا And Musa passed out and fainted from the greatness and the gravity of this event. And so seeing Allah Azza wa Jal in this dunya is something that a human being is incapable of. And it's something that Allah Azza wa Jal kept for the life to come. This is a privilege for the people of Jannah. Seeing Allah is a privilege for the people of Jannah. وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ Faces on that day will be illuminating, gazing at its Lord. It's confirmed in the Quran and the Sunnah that Allah Azza wa Jal will be seen in the life to come. But not in this life. Therefore, what does it mean when the Prophet ﷺ says, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَىٰ Then what does it mean that you worship Allah as though you can see Him? This is the concept of seeing with the light of Iman. And the light of Iman is one of the most beautiful things Allah granted the believer. And in fact, it is the sweetness of Iman. You see, when you look around you today, you find that human beings are in constant conflict with Allah. The vast majority of mankind are at odds with Allah. They have issues with Him. They have issues with His legislation. They have issues with His revelation. They have issues with his decree. They have issues with anything relating to religion. Atheism and agnosticism is widespread and becoming the trend and the most popular thing. Teenage kids, grown men and women. I mean, people are leaving the concept of believing in God wholesale. Whether it is Muslims or even people of other religion. The idea of believing in God has become even more foreign today than it was before. It continues to get more foreign, more odd. You become an outcast, a, a weirdo, someone who's old fashioned, old school. You're not hip enough, you're not cool enough. You still believe in God, miskin. You know, what a poor human being, still believing in these, you know, divine entities and stuff like that. This is, this is the popular thought right now. But for the believer, for the believer, everything around us, everything around us is an open invitation to see Allah. See Allah in a sense 
that in the creation of Allah, we observe His greatness, we identify His names and attributes, we love Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is actually a level of love that human beings are unable to attain unless they build it on Iman. That's why the Prophet ﷺ began with Islam. In the hadith, it mentions Islam first because Islam is the foundation. You must believe in the shahadatain. You must make the declaration of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah ﷺ for you to enter through the door. Then you have to have Iman. You must believe in Allah and His books and His angels and the last day and the messengers. You have to have the articles of faith. And once you have those and you have a proper understanding of them, then you elevate and you rise above the average and you enter into the stage of Ihsan where everything around you, every event, every incident, be it positive or negative, is addictive of the greatness of Allah and the mercy of Allah and the compassion of Allah. You don't see things in this pessimistic way that the rest of mankind sees it. A believer always understands that what Allah decreed is better for himself. And many things we come across that we find displeasing to us. We are discontent. We, have a state, we are in a state of discontent, discomfort with Allah's decree. And that is normal. That is a normal human reaction. It is equivalent to the crying of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when his son Ibrahim passed away. He said, "Inna al-qalb la yahzan, inna al-ayn la tadma', wa inna al-qalb la yahzan." The eye sheds tears. The eye will shed tears, and the heart is is agonized. You feel pain. ولكن لا نقول إلا ما يرضي ربنا. However, we will never say anything except that which is pleasing to Allah. إننا لله وإننا ليه راجعون. Verily, we belong to Allah, and to Allah we return. This was this level of iman. This is the ihsan which we learn from the Prophet ﷺ. So, any event that takes place for the believer is something good. Either it is a the sins we are committing, Allah Azza wa Jal is saving us from accountability for them on Yawm Al Qiyamah. You see, when we disobey Allah and we are all guilty, we are all guilty. When we disobey Allah, there's one of two things. Either Allah Azza wa Jal will not punish us for it. He will continue to give us the comfort and the ease of the dunya. And then on Yawm Al Qiyamah, it's time for retribution. And that is not when we want to deal with it. Trust me. But if something bad happens, a calamity, distress, anxiety, pain, suffering, whatever it is, if it's hastened now, that means Allah Azza wa Jal is making you pay for your sins and is making me pay for my sins now so that on Yawm Al Qiyamah there's nothing to pay for or anymore regarding those particular sins. It's an advance payment. And the payment now is manageable. Why is it manageable? Because no matter how bad it is, it still falls under the concept of لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah will never burden the soul beyond its scope. So it's manageable. On Yawm Al Qiyamah, it's also manageable. Manageable in the sense that if someone is in Jahannam or Ayyadu Billah, they will not like die, like they will not burn so much that they will die. It's not like the pain will be so severe that someone will just pass out. No. It's manageable in the sense that the human being will be given the, the endurance to go through massive amount of pain. But that is unbearable from a, from a psychological point of view. Physically, subhanAllah, the body will be able to deal with it. But psychologically, it will, be, it will tear someone up. When they look back and realize that their punishment has been stored for them. For the life to come, and a person is in the hellfire, billah, making that payment, that very hefty, painful payment. But when something happens now, you have, a really, you have good thought of Allah Azza wa Jal. 
Because you, you truly understand the names and attributes of Allah. It's not merely memorization. It's a true understanding of the names and attributes of Allah. It's reflecting on the ayat and the Quran. It is understanding the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And that that does not happen unless someone takes the route of acquiring knowledge. Ihsan cannot be attained by the ignorant. It is a level that is not made available for the ignorant. It's like someone who hasn't finished high school doesn't have the basic and they want to apply for a PhD. It just, it's just not an option. There is no option. There is no such option. You have to go through certain steps and you have to acquire certain fundamentals, certain degrees before you can apply for your doctorate or what have you. Otherwise, it's just not an option. No matter how bright you are. And similarly, Ihsan is something that is not made available for someone who does not truly know who Allah Azza wa Jal is. And knowing Allah is what the righteous people spend, spent their time doing. And this is where we are all falling short. Knowing Allah. And this is a concept known as Al-Uns Billah. That, that ease, that comfort, that tranquility, that peace that one finds when one thinks of Allah. Right now, in this very moment you all realize that Allah is looking at us. You see, this is, this is really the crux of it. Ihsan is to worship Allah as though you can see Him, as if we can see Allah, not physically, like I said, but with the iman, with our hearts, we see, we know Allah Azza wa Jal is there. If we can't reach that level, if there's no passion, this is a level of love and passion, then the level of, the level of, of fear and mindfulness and consciousness of Allah is know that Allah sees you. And this is one of the most effective deterrents from sinfulness. And this is what each one of us here needs. This is what each one of us here needs. If you can't do it out of love for Allah because He deserves it, then at least we should remember that Allah Azza wa Jal is ever looking at us. 24-7. Wallahu basirun bil ibad. Wallahu bima ta'amaluna basir. Verily Allah is, is, sees everything that you do. That concept is what will prevent someone from sin. When sin presents themselves, when sins they present themselves before us and we have, subhanallah, we have hundreds of thousands of options to sin. Countless options to sin with the smartphones and tablets and television. Any tool today, any tool can be used for sinfulness. Anything. With every limb in our body, with every visit to any place, you have hundreds of options to disobey Allah. And we do. No doubt, we do. But what is the most effective deterrent what will make you think twice or refrain? Just bring to mind the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal sees you. If we have Iman, we will become shy. And we will be ashamed. If we don't have Iman, or we don't have Iman that is strong enough, we will carry on with the sin. This is why Ihsan is a stage is a status that we, we all need today. If we don't have it, then we are surely taking a risk on our, you know, firmness in this religion, on being steadfast in this religion in a day and time when tribulations and trials have overtaken us. And we fear for ourselves, we fear for our family, we fear for our children, but there's absolutely no salvation unless we have at least the second level of Ihsan, which is, فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاك If you're unable to see him, if you can't reach that level of doing it out of love for the sake of Allah, 
and we will elaborate on that in a little bit inshallah then at least at least remember that Allah Azza wa Jal sees you and there are many evidences for that in the Quran when Allah said this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Allah Azza wa Jal he sees you when you stand up in prayer and he sees you while you are in the state of sujood among others so every salah and this is a reminder for myself and for you every salah is a conversation between one of us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then if we if we wonder where is the khushu' I don't have khushu' my khushu' has gone then we have the, there are many steps that are missing you know khushu' is is something you achieve when you've established certain steps for most of us, we have already missed so many steps, then naturally there will be no khushu'. Salah is just get it done. You see people looking around in the salah. It's impossible, impossible to have khushu'. If your eyes are gazing around. The only people who can attain khushu' are those who at least the bare minimum from a physical point of view, they gaze at the place of prostration. That is in terms of the physical, the eyes. And the heart is more dangerous than the eyes. When your eyes are in a good condition, now you can focus on the heart. When the eyes are out of control, the heart is twice as bad. When the eyes are good, now you can focus on the heart. Because the heart can also be wandering around. You can be shopping at the mall while you are praying. And we all know that. You can be shopping at a supermarket while you are praying, and we all know that. Some do their, you know, their salary breakdown in the salah. Some think about the past, present, and future in the salah. In fact, salah is the only time they have to think about these things. They're busy with all types of gadgets the whole time, and now on salah time, this is the time to focus on other matters. Subhanallah, this is the condition of most illa man rahim Allah. And let's admit and be honest with ourselves. But salah is that time when we're supposed to be mindful of Allah. You're saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allah Azza wa Jal replies to you and says, Hamidani Abdi. Yani, who is one of us for Allah to respond to him? I mean, I'm, let me put it in teenage context. If they spoke to one of these famous football players and he replied to them, one of them might have a heart attack. That he spoke to a soccer player and he gave him some attention. Let alone if they spoke to someone who they consider to be a big deal. And we are sitting there speaking to Allah. And Allah is replying to one of us by saying, Hamidani Abdi, my slave has praised me. For Allah to call one of us Abdi, Wallahi, this is the biggest privilege you will ever achieve in your life. Forget about everybody else what they think about you. And then when you say, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Allah will say, Athna alayya abdi, my slave has praised me. Maliki yawm din Allah will say, Majjadani abdi, my slave has glorified me. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in, it is you we worship and it is you we seek aid from. Allah will say, Hatha bayni wa bayna abdi wa li abdi ma sa'al, this is between me and my slave. Because there's and my slave will have that which he asked for. Until the end of Surah Al-Fatiha, it's an actual conversation with Allah. And I ask you, by Allah, when was the last time one of us went through Al-Fatiha with this in mind? Some might say, never in my entire life. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ spoke about a man who would be 60 and 70 years old. And he would have prayed all his life. Allah wouldn't accept any of his salawat. Because he never performed salah properly. People rushing through rukur, rushing through sujood, rushing through the jalsa between the uh, sajdatain, rushing through tashahud. The whole thing is just being rushed through. No, thing, no thought of subhana rabbi al azim subhana rabbi al-a'la. This is the bare minimum. This is the bare minimum. The one who has that higher level of ihsan, he actually looks forward to the salah. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, anytime something would bother him, he would escape to salah. 
That's why he would say expressions like Arihna biha ya Bilal. Bring us comfort with the salah, O Bilal. Call the iqama so we can pray. Because this is a time of tranquility and peace and connection. That's why it's called salah from sila. It's a connection with Allah. Today we don't, we don't have these things. We, we miss them. We miss them a great deal. And all of these, my brothers and sisters, all of these are interrelated and connected. And they are, they are based on each other. They complete each other. They supplement each other. It's a full cycle that we have to work on. Ihsan is what will bring about khushu' And khushu' will bring about ihsan. So that when you pray, you truly enjoy the prayer. You finally get to pour out your heart to Allah in the dua. Because we have a lot of stress and a lot of issues. The sujood is the time for you to tell Allah about what you're going through. And He already knows. And as the scholars used to say and continue to say, sometimes Allah Azza wa Jal, when He sees one of us drifting away, He will send something His way to bring him back. Allah might want to hear our dua, want to hear our voice, want to hear one of us begging him, beseeching him, seeking him. And as long as we are in good condition, we don't bother. Now as soon as calamity strike, we run back to Allah. It's a great wisdom from Allah how he deals with the slaves. And the ignorant amongst us think, why is Allah doing this to me? Why me? How come fulan has this and fulan has that and he has this and he has that? We look, we are so short-sighted, subhanallah. We assume bad of Allah. But we were told that by the Prophet ﷺ to have good assumption about Allah. And that Allah is whatever you think of Him. So choose what you want. You want it to be good, then you will receive good. And you want it to be bad, then you will receive bad. It's a choice that we make every single time. So this is in terms of Ihsan and the two levels of Ihsan. But notice that this whole discussion has been around or about your relationship with Allah. Azza wa Jal. But then what about the level of ihsan concerning mankind how do we understand ihsan ihsan is not restricted to the relationship between oneself and one's lord in fact ihsan cannot be achieved until we have perfected our relationship with allah to the best of our human abilities and the relationship with his creation and this is an area where many of us fall short as well they might, be, they might have a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms that they do their salah, they pray their sunan, they maintain their voluntary acts of worship. They're, they're doing okay in terms of their ibadah. But when it, the rights of Allah, in other words. But when it comes to the right of the creation, they squander them. They do not fulfill them. They fall short. They oppress. They transgress. They violate. And we have many examples today of the, specifically the extremists. The extremists who have taken it upon themselves to give us the worst image you could have of a religion. They continue to work day and night to tarnish the image of Islam. Continue to you know, commit acts of violence in any given opportunity in any country involving anyone, any civilian. And then they are proud to declare or claim responsibility for killing more people. And then they claim that this is Islam and this is the religion and that the rest of us are a bunch of hypocrites. Because we're not as serious and courageous as they are. And this is from the zulm and the deceit and the cheating. Cheating the Muslims and cheating the, the, the non-Muslims by giving them the false impression about the religion of Islam. And where are they from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Where are they from the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? In terms of his excellence and ihsan with others. With everybody. Including animals. 
including the, the inanimate objects, the mountain, the trees. The Prophet ﷺ was rahmatan lil alameen. He was mercy to mankind. Where is that mercy? How, how have we hijacked it and turned it into zulm and transgression to mankind? In the name of the Prophet ﷺ. How is that ihsan? How do you expect this to bring people to the deen of Allah? And how did Islam spread in the past if that was Islam's message to, the, to, to mankind? No one would accept. No one would have accepted. But there was, there was a balance. There was rationalism involved. It wasn't, it wasn't some extreme emotionalism as we have today. If you get emotional, you can do anything. Anybody can do something bad, extremely bad if they're emotional. But our deen calls us to the stability of the mind, thoughtfulness, contemplation, analysis, look into the situation before you take any action. Every action has a reaction. There are ramifications to the things which you do that affect you and affect the Muslims and affect the ummah. And we all have a responsibility towards that. We all have a responsibility towards that. And so every interaction with another human being is an opportunity to deliver the message of Islam and to display a form of ihsan. Now in this recent trip, when we're flying back from the country we're in with the, with the brothers in this latest uh, uh, you know, trip, we had a, a non-Muslim sitting uh, close to us. In the same row. And it became, yani it's, it's a very simple act. It's a very simple act. I have some snacks. I think it was uh, peanuts. And surely you can open your peanuts and eat them on your own. Or you could try to create an opportunity to engage someone in a positive way. And when I offered this person some peanuts, he only took maybe one or two, <coughs> excuse me, out of shyness, obviously. He's not, some people take the whole bag. Don't, don't go to extreme. Be mindful of the people offering you something. If someone offers you something, take just enough for them not to regret offering you anything. Because next time around, you might get nothing. He only took a, you know, a couple of pieces. And then afterwards, every single time he had some snack to eat, he would now offer me in return. And that's usually something that doesn't happen between two strangers on an airplane. Usually you're in your own zone, you pick up your own snacks and you eat them on your own and you mind your business type of thing. That little act of, I, I, I cannot even call it ihsan, honestly. This is aib, yani, this is nothing. Wallahi, it's, it's, a, it's a very little thing. It created a long time discussion with this gentleman to the point that I got the opportunity to tell him about Islam and about this lecture and that he will try to come here with his wife. I don't know whether he made it or not. A lot happened with a complete stranger that I've never met in my life because of the simplest act which we cannot even dare to call Ihsan because it's nothing. And I'm not telling you this so you can, you know, give me a round of applause or say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Wallahi, يعني, I, I will benefit nothing from this. Even if all of you appreciated it, if Allah doesn't accept it, then it's, it's not gonna, it, it will backfire on me. I'm just trying to use real life examples. It's better than all these hypothetical ones. About little acts and many opportunities that we get on daily basis to have some ihsan in spite of our shortcomings. In spite of our shortcomings of how you can invite people to Islam. Turn around on other flights, and I'm again giving you practical examples where you see fellow Muslims, and you cannot question, you cannot doubt for a second that they're Muslims, who behave in the most uncivilized way on the airplane. There's very bad smell, you can smell it three meters away and the whole demeanor the whole demeanor and behavior is unacceptable and you see all the non-muslims around people going like this covering their nose or just being overwhelmed with this behavior 
and you, I'm standing there like I'm, I'm hurting inside. I'm in pain. And you just want to grab and say, why? Why? Why do we have to have such bad representation of this religion? Did, did the Prophet ﷺ not teach us about the etiquettes of cleanliness and, and how to take care of oneself? Did not the Prophet ﷺ smell the, like the best musk all the time? Did he not always appear in the best condition ﷺ? Did he not take care of himself? As soon as he would enter his house, he would use the miswak, even though it's with his own wife. And some will say, your wife is going to deal, she's, she likes you either way, otherwise she wouldn't have married you. So you know, you can get away with some things. No, no, this was not the standard of the Prophet ﷺ. And these are examples of ihsan with other people that not only we don't engage in, rather we do some so, sort of oppression to others. And that means we are far away from the ideal condition that a Muslim needs to be in. We're far away, subhanAllah, so far away. But I want to remind myself and you that there's a lot of room for improvement. In spite of our shortcomings and maybe our you know, misbehavior every now and then, still at the end of the day, we represent Islam whether we like it or not. And we can capitalize on this in any given occasion to show the best possible behavior that we can display and try to attain Allah's pleasure, try to get this level of ihsan, that you're not only mindful of Allah, but you're also mindful of how you treat His creation. And that is da'wah. That is the essence and the reality and the manifestation of da'wah. Lecture, no problem, anybody can do this. But the real da'wah is, happens sometimes by the people that speak the least. The people that speak the least are those who are giving most da'wah. Not necessarily those who speak the most. But it's about these acts. So you do your own self-evaluation. Under which category do you fall? Are you among those who when you are among other people, they look and say that these Muslims, man, they have no basic manners? Or are they appreciating, you're, engage, you're engaging them, you're creating a positive environment? maybe putting a smile on their face, whatever style, whatever approach that you like, that is suitable for you and your personality. Each one does it his own way. But we create this positivity so that they can relate to Islam in some good way. And this is an obligation on us that we need to be mindful of. So Ihsan is not just restricting it to the worship of Allah, but it's also Ihsan to the creation of Allah. Let me share with you some expressions of the righteous predecessors and some reminders from them. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, from among the signs that one's heart is sound, from among the signs and indications that one heart, one's heart is sound, Allah yaftura an dhikri rabbih, that his heart and you don't, you don't stop remembering Allah. So you are consistent with the adhkar of the morning and the adhkar of the evening, and the adhkar after the salah. And anytime you see something that is pleasing, or you often say subhanallah, you often say alhamdulillah, you often say Allahu Akbar, you're, you're mindful of Allah, you're constantly remembering Allah, physically with your tongue, and, in, and you with your heart. You see the creation of Allah, you look at the, the heavens here, look at the sky above you. You look at the sky above you, wallahi, you can lessons. That's why how many times did Allah Azza wa mention as samawat wal ard, ayat, that there are signs in the heavens and the earth. Just pondering upon the creation of Allah. وَلَا يَسْأَمْ مِنْ خِدْمَتِهِ And you don't feel tired of providing servitude. You don't get bored of worshipping Allah. And you don't find complete peace of mind and peace of and tranquility except with Allah. You don't feel 100% safe and, and comfortable unless you are mindful of Allah. Except with another person who guides you to Allah. You only find that level of comfort and tranquility with someone who guides you to Allah. So when you with, with someone who doesn't remind you of Allah, you feel that there's some sort of barrier. And we were discussing this with the shabab, the teenagers. 
when, when we speak about selecting friends, you have to select someone who will guide you to Allah, who will remind you of Allah. If you select a friend who will distance you from Allah, and you are completely fine with it, this is an indication that the heart is, is sick. That the heart is diseased. One of the righteous predecessors says, Masakeen Ahlid Dunya. They are in a state of poverty. Miskeen, someone you feel pity for. The people of the dunya. dunya They left this world and they never got to taste the sweetest, the, the most delicious thing in this dunya. It was said to him, what is the most, the sweetest and the most delicious thing in this dunya? He said, loving Allah and feeling comfortable and, and feeling tranquility when you are mindful of his presence, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a manner which befits his majesty. And anticipation to meet him and finding pleasure in, in remembering him and obeying him. <coughs> and so we understand from some of these expressions that after when you reach the level of ihsan there's a level known as al muraqaba or al mushahada it's like a state of observation where you become observant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so that everything that happens around you is a constant reminder of Allah and this is the affair of the believer just think about it. The first thing you do when you wake up is you remember Allah. Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana ba'da ma amatana wa ilayhi nushur. You remember Allah as soon as you wake up. Then, when you enter the bathroom, assuming you enter the bathroom, before you enter the bathroom, you make dua. Bismillah, a'udhu billahi min al-khubuthi wal khabai. Then you exit the bathroom, you remember Allah. Ghufranak. Then you say the adhkar. During work, while driving, whatever, you listen to the Qur'an, you're engaged in some sort of dhikr. Before you eat, you say Bismillah. After you're done eating, say Alhamdulillah, hadha, whichever dua you have memorized. And so you will find that you, you constantly have an occasion to remember Allah. Besides the five uh, salawat and the adhan and going to the masjid and recitation of the Qur'an, and so the believer's life revi revolves around this concept. And so the reminder for me and for you, my brothers, is if we are not at the level of Ihsan, we will not enjoy our Islam. If we have not achieved the level of Ihsan, we will not properly enjoy our Islam and our Iman. For you to start benefiting truly from one's Islam and one's Iman, we have to strive to reach the level of Ihsan. And no one can reach that level if they have some superficial knowledge of the Arkan al-Iman, for example. And tu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawm al-akhir wa tu'mina bil qadari khayrihi wa sharrihi to believe in Allah and his revelation, his messengers, to believe in the last day, and to believe in Qadr, the good and the bad, and the angels. If you have, or if I have, superficial knowledge, just basic fundamental knowledge of these matters, there's no way we can reach Ihsan. Ihsan is only attained when we have proper understanding of these six pillars of Iman. And before we elaborate on the rest, let's just focus on the first one, and tu'mina billah, to believe in Allah. A lot of us are not aware of the names and attributes of Allah. Or they don't know what they mean. We don't know what Al-Jameel means. Al-Latif, Al-Wadud, Al-Rahim, Al-Ghaffar. The names and attributes of Allah appear all over the Quran. We have little awareness of them. We only read them when we read the book of Allah. We are not aware of their meanings. Or we don't understand them in a practical manner. But... This life is meant to be a lot of, of struggle. It's meant to, you're meant to suffer. We are meant to suffer in this dunya. The only thing that will allow us to swiftly move in this life until we meet Allah is having that level of ihsan. 
That is the guide that will facilitate this dunya. And that's how our righteous predecessors were able to achieve so much, to provide so much. Look how much knowledge we inherited from them. Shaykh al-Sab ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. How much knowledge have we inherited from this one man? This one man who was imprisoned so many times for no crime he committed. His crime was to give a fatwa that didn't sit well with the, the people that were misguided. That's all. And in spite of that, he produced massive amount of knowledge that we benefit from until today. Because he is a manifestation, wallahu alam, of ihsan. This is someone that truly enjoyed ihsan. And when we taste it, we will never be able to let go. And so I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to open our hearts and cleanse them and bring us and return us to the state that is pleasing to Him and to make us among those who strive to achieve and acquire the level of Ihsan. Really is able to do all things. Uh, we will have a quick Q&A session inshallah. So uh, feel free to ask questions. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد. Assalamu alaikum brothers. We request, uh, brothers and sisters, we request you to keep the questions on the topic. So kindly restrict the questions uh, to the topic. If you have any questions, kindly raise your hand. I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, just as a general guideline, um, if you could give like a few steps on how a person, like you were saying the first article of it, how can a person increase uh, his iman in uh, belief in Allah by knowing the names and attributes? What way can a person take in terms of learning the aqidah? Barakallah feek. Alhamdulillah wa sallallahu wa ala nabiya Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, we are in an age where uh, knowledge is, is easily accessible. Um, you are already familiar with, with a list of uh, speakers that uh, you know, have uh, put out authentic material. Um, and it's just a matter of going through some of the books that deal specifically with the names and attributes of Allah. It's one of those uh, sciences that require um, some patience to learn. Uh, I, I've gone through the book, for example, Al-Aqeed Al-Wasitiyah, uh, Sheikh al Sami Tamir, Rahimahullah, and you can find it on my website, onewayreparadise.net. Uh, there are maybe 200 or something MP3 files going over the whole book, which basically deals with the belief system uh, of, of, uh, that you're supposed to be upon in terms of Aqeedah. And it warns you from all the other uh, possible deviations which exist within the Ummah. So it's pretty precise, Alhamdulillah. And you will find it useful, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, so it, it, it's just that you take it one step at a time. Or, for example, you, each week you choose one of the names of Allah, one of the attributes of Allah, and you study whatever relevant, authentic material on it. And then you try to practically implement it in your life in a sense that you, you bring to mind the relevance of this quality with your daily condition. And then within time, inshallah, when you do this constantly, in no time, you would have had a proper acquisition of the subject matter. And you will see the impact it will have on your life. You know, when, when you become mindful of these things, subhanAllah, it, it creates a certain kind of light in the heart and ease. You, you're able to deal with situations in a much better way than someone who is distant from Allah. And you can see this all over the place. The people who believe in Allah versus those who don't believe, their reactions to events, same events, are 100% contrast. And so that is, a, that is a concept that is based on the proper understanding. So one step at a time, inshallah. Good question. We have a question from the lady's side. Yes, sure. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Hayakum Allah. Learning Arabic, trying to learn the perfect in it is it kind of ihsan 
learning Arabic. Well, learning Arabic is a means to attain Ihsan. In a sense that when we mention the steps that one has to go through to reach level of Ihsan, and among them is um, the proper understanding. I, like I said, it's, it's Ihsan is a level that is not available to those who are ignorant. Honestly, you will never attain the proper knowledge in, in the full-fledged sense until you know Arabic. And ask anyone who has gone and studied the Arabic language and ask them about before and after. And I remember our beloved brother, Sadr Muhammad Tim Humble, in, in his talk recently, he mentioned that when he, before he le learned Arabic, he felt like he was handcuffed, he was shackled. You know, you reach a, a limit. No, because whenever you read translated material, you are forced to accept the opinion of the translator, the, the belief of the translator, the preference of the translator, the choice of words. Like right now in my lecture, I use maybe 50 words that I translated from, from Arabic to English. But if maybe another speaker would have used another 50 that are more eloquent or would have made more sense to you or you could have related to them more. And this is just because of, for example, my limitation. So imagine when you're reading translated material and now we're basing it on that which has been translated. Don't even discuss things which hasn't even been translated. A lot of rich content in Arabic that has no English translation until today. So your access to knowledge is either the content is available in Arabic, it's not available in English, so you have no access, or you have, you have it in English, but now you're forced to accept along with it the opinion and the de definition and the choice of words of the translator. In either case, you are limited. So your knowledge is not, cannot grow at the pace that you want it to grow. And therefore, Ihsan becomes even a more difficult uh, target to reach. Not that it's not reachable, but it becomes a little bit more complicated. Versus knowing Arabic will give you the strongest platform and foundation to understand. Let's just give you a simple example. Let's say someone doesn't know Arabic. Excuse me. Someone doesn't know Arabic and they read Surah Al-Qari'ah. And another person knows Arabic and they also read Surah Al-Qari'ah in the Salah. The, the difference is between the heavens and the earth. Because the one who doesn't know, he's just reciting Surah Al-Qari'ah. He knows it's in Juzu Amma. He knows it's in the Sigar Suwar. It's among the small chapters and it ends like that. For the one who understands, you know, uh, just going through the ayat, the description of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and you know, then the, the, then the division of mankind. Whoever's scales are heavy, he is in this pleasant state. He is enjoying life. Those ayat alone are, are scary. As scary as it can be. Whoever's scales are low, then the head, um, يعني the, the top of his head is going to be in the fire. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هِيَ نَارٌ حَامِيَ Blazing, hot, scorching fire. Subhanallah, just thinking about these ayat now might... Yani if somebody wanted to disobey Allah and they happen to recite Surah Al-Qari'ah and the Salah, 80% they will quit. 80% chance they will no longer commit the sin they had intended to do after Salah. Because they themselves reminded themselves with, with these ayat. And this is just a very basic example. And the list goes on. Same thing to Surah Al-Zalzala. It's just one grain of mustard, equivalent to one grain of mustard of good, you will see it. And then if you do evil, equivalent to that, you will also see it. Then you're like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I'm, I'm not ready for this. Any surah, if you know Arabic, it will have an impact on you that the, the non-Arabic speaking person will never have. Unless they're reading it, then they're reading the English, and we go back. The English will not have the same impact as the words of Allah. Because it's human, human work. And the Quran is the word of Allah, it's not human. So the impact of the ayat in Arabic can never, ever be equal to whatever you read in English, even if Shakespeare himself translated it. And he didn't. It's not going to be the same. I'm, I'm saying this to encourage you, Arabic... Will, will make all the difference. And a lot of us are able to learn, but are lazy. Lazy. Those are the same people. If your job told you, how much do you get paid now? 
15,000 dirham, we will give you 45,000. If you learn French, most people will be enrolled in, a, in an institute the same night. The same night you'll be already learning French. Bonjour, comment ça va? So, mashallah alaik. Say, of course, Habibi, this is triple my salary. Dunya wise, we all will work that extra mile. Come for the deen. Yeah, Sheikh. I did the first course, level one, and ba'dayn khalas. That was eight years ago. And every time you try to restart it, you do level one again. And then you stop. And you've been doing level one for 20 years. Never went to level two. Or level three, let alone advanced Arabic. That's the reality. This is based on brothers I know. Feedback from people I know. It's about time to change that. If you're able to change that, change that. And see. See the difference. Wallahu alam. That was a lecture on its own. <laughs> But that was an excellent question, mashallah. We have one more question from the lady's side. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam. I'm not a Sheikh. Tfadali. Jazakumullah khair. Wa iyaakum. My question is regarding the dua, remembrance of Allah. Um, if you can remember all the dua, let's say dua, uh, when you wake up, you say alhamdulillah. Um, and you keep saying Bismillah when you go into the washroom. Um, will that be considered uh, less of, of uh, hasanat, or do we have to like? We cannot. Like, some people cannot remember all the duas, but we t like. Um, that's what I need to know. Like, do we have to remember every dua, or is it sufficient if you can remember Allah by saying Bismillah with everything you do and Alhamdulillah? No, it is insufficient. And the reason why I'm saying it's insufficient is because of the, uh, the fact that the scholars say anything pertaining to ad'iyah and adhkar is, has to be verbatim as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught. Because in one hadith, when one of the sahabi said, وَرَسُولَكَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلْتَهِ The Prophet sallallahu told him, no. وَنَبِيَّكَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلْتَهِ He said, and Oh Allah, and the messenger you have sent, the Prophet ﷺ said, no. And the prophet you have sent, even though the, every messenger is a prophet, these terms are often used interchangeably. So the concept doesn't change whether he said, Rasulaka ladhi arsalt, aw nabiyaka ladhi arsalt, the messenger you sent, or the prophet you sent, the meaning is achieved. Yet the Prophet ﷺ said, no, he insisted that he use the term nabiyak. Based on this and other evidences, the scholars say that you must say exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said for you to attain the full reward. And if there's something that is numbers pertaining, if he said 33 times, you have to say it 33 times. If he said 7 times, you have to say it 7 times. If he said 100 times, you have to say it 100 times. If he said 99 times, you have to say it 99 times. And all those exist in the sunnah, these numbers. If you go more or you go less, you will no longer get that which is promised. Now, will you get rewarded for remembering Allah versus one who doesn't remember Allah? Surely. But any promise that the hadith comes with, you shall not attain. For example, the Prophet ﷺ taught us that whoever says after completing his meal, Alhamdulillah الذي أطعمني هذا ورزقنيه من غير حول مني ولا قوة غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه Whosoever says after completing his meal or praises due to Allah who provided me with this, who fed me this and provided me with it without any power from my end, without any ability, without any strength on my own, he will have all of his previous sins forgiven. If you say half of it, you have remembered Allah but you will not get the promise of the dua. You will not get all your previous sins forgiven. So what is the advice? The advice is, okay, if you have not learned them all, alhamdulillah, you are excused. And we hope based on Allah's generosity that you will get that. Provided that you're trying to learn. How long does it take for us to memorize the dua? Honestly, one day, two days, three days. When we had exams, I remember. When I, was, when I used to go to school and we had exams, when we had to memorize so much nonsense. 
and you had to memorize it verbatim, especially in physics and biology, you know, all the, what is meiosis and mitosis and all these words. I, I only remember the titles now. But you couldn't go to the exam and write some gibberish or something on your own and expect a full grade. And you couldn't memorize it maybe from the first time, but trust me, when you studied it day one, day two, day three, and let's say the exam was in a week, if somebody were to ask you what is, you know, a catalyst, you will immediately give the definition. And I remember this from science as well. You would memorize it. Why? With time. So if, how long does it take? A month? A two months? A year? Two years? Until now we haven't memorized a few words? No, it's, it, honestly, there's no excuse. Unless someone has a learning disability. But for the rest of us, it's a matter of, you know, practice. Just practice it. Read it every day, five, six times. Within a week, inshallah, you will have it memorized. And then you can get the full reward that the Prophet ﷺ promised in all of these adhkar, whether the morning, in the evening, before the bathroom, after the bathroom, anything from the Prophet ﷺ, you expect the full reward when you stick to the exact words of the Prophet ﷺ. Wallahu alam. This will be the last question for the day, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm asking about koshu in salah. Yes, sir. So what should you do to have koshu in salah? There are a number of things that you have to do uh, to attain koshu in salah. Uh, first of all, I have a lecture on the topic uh, titled uh, Errors in Connection. So when you're free, you can look it up on YouTube, Errors in Connection. Uh, make sure that you put my name next to it. Watch the otherwise you're going to get like a video about telephones and problems with the telecommunication. Um, but the lecture, I break it down in detail. But just to give you a brief answer right now, uh, first of all, there's the external preparation uh, in terms of preparing yourself outwardly. And then there are two important matters to keep in mind in the salah. First of all, awareness and mindfulness of what you're saying. Like, as I explained earlier, when you know Surah Al-Fatiha, you know what it means. Every ayah you say, you bring to mind that you are speaking to Allah. And that will help you attain khushu'ah. And then the general state of being mindful that you are standing, as the scholars say, between the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal, praying to Him. And that Allah Azza wa Jal is looking at you while you are in that state. And so how can you be preoccupied or busy with anything? Is there, is there anything more important than Allah? I mean, we left the dunya to pray to Him. And then while we are praying to Him, we're thinking about the dunya, it just doesn't add up. You know what I mean? So that is a time dedicated to Allah Azza wa Jal. If you keep your mind active in this manner and be careful of the whispers of the shaitan. Whenever the shaitan whispers, you seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan. Even if you have to spit to your left without actual saliva, just like three times. Seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan until you get in the habit of fo focusing on the salah. So knowing what you're saying, being mindful that Allah is looking at you, and then giving each pillar of the salah its due right. Don't hasten. Don't, be, don't go through this speedy Gonzalez Salah. You know, where everything is done within a minute. MashaAllah, he's already from takbir to taslim. It is not a race or a competition. If you give each movement in the Salah its due right, then inshaAllah ta'ala you will attain khushu'ah. And, and the last advice is be patient. Meaning don't, let's say you, right now you feel motivated and you're spiritually uplifted. So you go pray and then you don't get it. You say, I'm I'm tired of this. I don't want to try. Give it some time. It might take a month more. It could take a year. As long as you continue to try. One of the Salaf said, it took me 20, 20 years. I struggled to attain khushu' and salah. And then I enjoyed it for 20 years. He spent 20 years working on himself. Until he reached the target, then he enjoyed it for 20 years afterwards. So that's a total of 40 years, 20 of which were an effort on his part. So be, I'm not saying it's going to take 20 years, inshallah it will take less. But you have to be patient, because the shaitan wants you to give up. Oh, you tried, it didn't work, khalas, forget it. No, no, don't give up. Continue to try until you attain it, inshallah. And it's attainable, bi'ithnillah. So that was the last question, I believe. Like, I really uh, thank you for your attendance and for your uh, manners in, in listening attentively and for asking these uh, beneficial questions. Zakumullah khair and hope to see you in the near future, inshallah. 
سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته